Uh, so, hi, and, and thanks for coming. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, a little surprised by how many people uh, have never heard of John Cheever, uh, much less read John Cheever. Uh, because in 1979, there was a, there was a Philadelphia Inquirer survey uh, for the living writers whose work was most likely to endure and be read by future generations. And Schieffer uh, was third on that list, uh, behind only his two eulogists, Saul Bellow and John Updike. Uh, if that survey were held today, and, and if Schieffer were still alive to participate in it, uh, it is highly unlikely that he would be anywhere uh, in the top 20. Um, this, of course, is a deplorable state of affairs, um, which I hope my, uh, my book will remedy somewhat, as well as the Library of America, a uh, cheaper edition. Um, also, kind of heartening, <coughs> there it goes, um, the, uh, the National Book Foundation polled critics um, to determine which of the um, of, of, of the fiction winners of the National Book Award um, w was the greatest of all time. And, and the stories of John Cheever was among the, the six finalists. So, so that, that's a good thing, right? Um, what, whatever Cheever's decline in terms of his literary reputation cannot be attributed to his having had a dull uh, life. Uh, his <laughs> life was quite interesting. Um, John Updike described it as a redemptive fable. Um, perhaps because, uh, well, for many reasons, one of which was that Cheever was, of course, a colossal alcoholic um, for most of his life. And in 1975, he had pretty much drunk himself to death. And uh, they stuck him into Smithers Rehabilitation Center uh, on the Upper East Side. And he got sober. And he never took another drink uh, for the last seven years of his life. Um, two years after Smithers, he published his novel, Falconer, as he always insisted it should be pronounced. Um, it got number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, it, he got his face on uh, the cover of Newsweek. Uh, the, the year after that, he published The Stories of John Cheever, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for six months. It won the Pulitzer and every other prize, and blah, 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 and so on. By the time Cheever died in 1982, he was at the pinnacle of his thing. And there were long, adulatory uh, obituaries on the front pages of everywhere that mattered. Time magazine called him a celebrant of sunlight. Um, and, and his hometown newspaper, uh, Boston Globe, because he was born and raised in Quincy, not only ran the big, long front page obituary, but also uh, ran an editorial which said, John Cheever was not only a marvelous writer, but he was a good and a gracious man. Well, as we shall see, uh, Cheever's literary reputation is not the only thing that has declined. Uh, also, his reputation as a good and a gracious man. Of course, it's a very complicated business. Um, I'm going to start by reading a short excerpt from my book. Um, and it's about sort of Cheever's first real flush of fame. In 1964, he was on the cover of Time magazine. Um, he had recently published uh, The Wapshot Scandal, which would go on to win the uh, Howells Medal for the best novel of the previous five years. He was about to publish The Swimmer, arguably his greatest short story, and arguably uh, one of the two or three greatest American short stories of the post-war era. Um, and he was well on his way to becoming uh, the, the, the dean of the American short story. Uh, in, in, in doing this reading, <coughs> I'm going to uh, do my usual lame cheaper imitation. Uh, the call, you know, sort of like this and how the third and Gilligan's Island. Uh, because it's really important that you get a sense of this sort of public persona that Cheever tried so hard to cultivate. Um, it, was, it was desperately important to Cheever that he be perceived as this, uh, as this kind of Massachusetts Brahmin, right? Um, in his adopted hometown of Ossidy, New York, he bred a Labrador retrievers. Uh, he lived in this old uh, stone-ended Dutch colonial farmhouse. He owned land in the Hudson Valley, and so on. 
he was not a Brahmin. His father was a traveling shoe salesman. Um, so that was an entirely confected persona. Um, and I, I have to try to give you uh, an impression of that. So without further ado, <coughs> Cheever used to say that he had two conspicuous lacks, a singing voice and a self-image. By the latter, he meant, on one level, a public image, the lack of which was due, he said, to a genuine horror of notoriety, engendered by his Yankee upbringing. Also, sober, he was a desperately shy man who felt oppressed by strangers. He tended to drink before any public appearance, and then would smile, smile, smile until his face ached. What else to do? And afterward, he felt so ashamed of himself that he drank more. But then he always professed not to care about fame. Literature, he was fond of saying, was like a vast impersonal stream. He himself had been influenced by everything since the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and though his own work might be forgotten, it wouldn't disconcert me in the least. It would forever be part of that stream running into the future. Asked about Cheever's stream concept, his son Federico laughed, quote, to say he stood on the shoulders of giants is to say he is Isaac Newton. It's a wonderful kind of double play. You say, ah, oh, I'm nothing in the great stream of things, but of course in saying that, you put yourself in the great stream of things, unquote. <laughs> Cheever's appearance on the cover of Time magazine in 1964 increased his visibility in the stream and also gave him the beginnings of an image, that of a serious and likable person, no less, not to mention one of the great writers of his generation. He began to be noticed on the street, and he really didn't mind at all. <laughs> now perhaps he'd be fussed over in restaurants and whatnot. His barber might tack his picture to the wall. Meanwhile, his mailbox was stuffed almost daily with, excuse me, <coughs> time covers to autograph, and Cheever was only too happy to oblige. This serious and likable, witty and gifted author began to worry about things like publicity photos and was dismayed when others failed to share these concerns. Shown an advertisement featuring her husband's likeness, Mary Cheever remarked, what are they going to do with it? Pin it up in the post office? <laughs> Should there be some way of seeing this humorously? Cheever fumed in his journal, I would be most grateful. Gin seems to be the only way out. <laughs> What Cheever anxiously sought in these photos, perhaps, was some further confirmation of the image so perfectly captured by Time magazine, which had initiated, as Federico put it, the media shakedown cruise for the new landowning Cheever. Quote, Cheever wears Brooks Brothers shirts with their conspicuously missing pockets and would never consider having a mongrel dog, the magazine noted alongside pictures of the Tweedy author and his faithful retrievers strolling around his Westchester estate. And lest he seem an beast, a cartoon gentleman like John O'Hara with his spats and hard-finished suits, Cheever wore clothes as though he'd been born in them. One collar point of a button-down shirt was carefully unbuttoned. His crew-neck sweater was gone in the elbows, and his Walsh pants were rumpled and stained. Real aristocrats, to say nothing of real men, didn't worry about whether their creases were ironed as long as the label said Brooks and certain other touches were right. I am a wasp. My God, look, he remarked with his usual protective irony to a journalist, palms over a Seth Thomas clock on Monday, Thursday. <laughs> the main aspect of this personage was his curious <coughs> accent. Was he a Cambridge Brahmin? British? What? It was hard to pin down. Philip Roth pointed out that it wasn't really a New England accent at all, more like an upper-class New Yorker, someone like Plimpton, perhaps. This was close, so Cheever's accent was somewhat more mutable than Plimpton's. When appearing on the Dick Cavett show or putting an impudent barkeep in his place, Cheever became almost a parody of the pompous Toff. But at other times, relaxed, cracking jokes, he sounded not unlike a boy from the South Shore of Massachusetts with an English mother, which he was. I knew John before he had an accent, said Jerry Mangione, his old WPA colleague from the 30s. No matter. <coughs> Most agree that Cheever's accent became a well-assimilated part of the persona, a suave fictional dialect, as the poet Dana Joy put it, 
that seemed to have the force of ancient authority, as if he were some New England homer standing at the apex of a long oral tradition. Nor would it be accurate to say that the persona itself, in its finished form, was false. He saw what he wanted, and he became it, said Alan Jurganis. That's what Cary Grant said, who started with Archie Leach. I made up the name Cary Grant, and then I became him. One thinks of F. Scott Fitzgerald, or rather Cheever did. You'll notice I take my glasses off and put them on a lot. <laughs> um, noting the disparity between Fitzgerald the vulgar drunken prankster and Fitzgerald the artist, Fitzgerald the well-meaning father, who, quote, preserved an angelic austerity of spirit, Cheever wrote, quote, noble might be a better word. Since as a boy in what had been the frontier town of St. Paul, he had considered himself to be a lost prince. How sensible of him. His mother was the ruthless and eccentric daughter of a prosperous Irish grocer. His gentle father belonged to the fringe aristocracy of the commercial traveler, moving from Syracuse to Buffalo and back again. How else could he explain his giftedness? Cheever might just as well have been describing himself. Also, like Fitzgerald and any number of American writers, he was a wistful snob, simultaneously enchanted and repelled by a materialistic culture where artists, no matter how great, remain outcasts to some extent. Fitzgerald, finding his, father, his grandfather listed in the St. Paul Social Register as a grocer, penciled in the word wholesale. <laughs> Cheever, feeling belittled in some way, would pull an accent and become the lost prince of Quincy, Massachusetts. And yet the part of him that remained Archie Leach, so to speak, was a humble man who felt tender toward the other Archie Leaches of the world. I can't connect my life, Cheever remarked once in the late 70s. That person in the army wasn't me, and there was a whole lot before that I can't connect either. There were other lives, too, until finally he became the world-famous writer and Westchester squire. Quote, it is strange to relate that I never had such a clear impression of knowing someone so well as on the first evening I met John Cheever in the 50s, said the writer Elizabeth Spencer. The two remained friends over the next 25 years, as Spencer never again felt remotely as close to Cheever. Quote, but I continue to believe that that funny and charming person was the real one. <coughs> OK. Um, given that my, my previous uh, biographical subject was Richard Yates, uh, he wrote Revolutionary Road and, and other novels. Uh, I think this is, okay, the water drives on some kind of corn syrup. Okay. Um, <coughs> Yates, of course, was also a, a ruinous alcoholic like Cheever. And people have come to the reasonable conclusion that I have a morbid uh, preoccupation with white guys who are drunk all the time, which, <laughs> which is true. Um, but what really, uh, what really appeals to me is, is compartmentalized personalities, and certainly that was the case with, uh, with Yates. Um, there was a yawning gap between Yates's public persona and, and the private man. Um, he rarely went out, ventured out, with, with uh, like a Brooks Brothers suit, and uh, he was very gentlemanly when sober, and had this sort of diffident stammer, you know. Um, he also had the foulest mouth uh, on the planet. He was given to incredible rages, and he lived in these apartments of just Dostoyevsky and squalor. Um, Cheever, to say that Cheever <coughs> That there was that there is a disparity between Cheever's uh, public and private person does not begin to to state the case. Um, Cheever was a hive of paradoxes, uh, nicely reconciled in my book. I like to think. Um, 